Hello and welcome to the Cosmocon Plenary Talk with Will Kinney. Will is a professor at University of Buffalo and his work is focused mainly on inflation. Today he is going to be telling us about the eternal hilltop inflation and this talk is based primarily on two papers that you can find linked in his slides. Will, you have the floor. Sure. Thanks very much. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so this talk is about uh, eternal inflation, uh, in particular in hilltop inflation models, which, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, are the ones that seem to be favored by the uh, uh, current Planck data. Um, and this is an interesting story because, well, we'll get into that, but it, it also relates to uh, some of the recently proposed swampland conjectures as well. And we'll talk about that briefly. So uh, here are a couple of references uh, for the two papers that, are gonna, that have most of the content that I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, the first one was in collaboration with uh, Gabriela Berenboim and Juan Il Park uh, at University of Valencia. Um, and the second one was a single author paper that I wrote last year uh, talking about uh, the, this, uh, these kind of results in, in light of uh, recent swampland conjectures. Um, so to start with, let's talk about some of the basics of eternal inflation itself. So in inflation in general, you have a scalar field rolling on some sort of very flat, shallow, shallow slope potential. And there are two basic uh, uh, sources of time evolution for a field. The first is the classical evolution, which uh, everybody's familiar with. And this has this uh, second order nonlinear differential equation govern governing the motion, uh, which is essentially that this thing in slow roll rolls down the hill slowly with the slope of the potential. This is the, this is the slow roll uh, evolution that's uh, probably familiar to, to most of the audience. Um, but there's a second, evolution as well, which is quantum fluctuations, right? We're familiar with the idea that quantum fluctuations in the field uh, are uh, uh, typically of order the, the, the Hubble parameter during inflation. And what this does is, in terms of a, a back reaction on the classical evolution, what happens is that the classical evolution is monotonically down the hill, but the quantum evolution can kick it in either direction, either up the hill or down the hill. And to incorporate this quantitatively into, a, uh, into the equation of motion, typically what's done here is writing it down as a Fokker-Planck equation, where you replace this zero on the right-hand side for the classical evolution with some sort of stochastic driving term that represents the quantum evolution of the field. And kind of getting ahead of, uh, of ourselves a little bit is the idea that then if the quantum fluctuations are larger than the classical perturbations, this is the re region where you enter internal inflation, where you're just as likely to jump up the hill as you are to roll down it. Um, so we can estimate these two different rates, right? What's the rate of classical evolution relative to the quantum evolution? The classical evolution we can write down as the field excursion in about one Hubble time. How far does the field roll in, in, in one Hubble time of expansion? Since the Hubble constants, the Hubble parameter is approximately constant during inflation, then this delta phi classical is just phi dot divided by h, right? Because the typical time scale for uh, the Hubble time is h inverse, so that this gives you the delta phi in uh, one delta t that, cor that corresponds to h inverse. So you figure that the field rolls about phi dot over h in one Hubble time. Meanwhile, the uh, quantum perturbations on the scale of the horizon size, we can estimate is that the, the, the corresponding quantum fluctuation in the same amount of time is just given by the quantum fluctuation at the horizon scale for inflation, right? So instead of writing this down as a Fokker-Planck equation, what we're doing here is just coming, making a simple rate estimate, right? So we're doing a less complicated analysis. This is a way to do an estimate. And so if we take delta phi classical as phi dot over h, delta phi quantum looks like h over 2 pi. That's, that's delta phi when the wavelength of the mode is equal to the horizon size. Then your condition for eternal inflation, that quantum fluctuations dominate over classical ones, is simply that delta phi quantum over delta phi classical has to be greater than 1 
And that's h squared over two pi phi dot, which an interesting fact is that this condition for eternal inflation, this expression, this fraction that has to be greater than one is exactly, even up to factors of two pi, the curvature perturbation amplitude at horizon crossing. So this is the amplitude, the power spectrum uh, amplitude for the co-moving curvature perturbation. So the condition that quantum fluctuations dominate over classical ones is identical to the condition that your curvature power spectrum be greater than unity, that you actually have a non-perturbative co-moving power spectrum. So just a question. So that means that you can find the signature in the amplitude, right? Well, this wouldn't be at observable scales, right? So we know that the Kobe normalization is that P of K is 10 to the minus five. So that we certainly, we have, observationally, we know that um, during the phase of inflation where curvature, per, where, where, the, where the CMB fluctuations are generated or where structure is generated, this fraction is much, much, much less than one, right? It's 10 to the minus five or so. So this would be earlier on in inflation at some point, right? So in inflation, uh, short scales exit later, long scales exit earlier, long wavelengths exit earlier. And so this would be lo a long, long time before the CMB scales exited. So you, you would be talking about perturbation modes that would be very large compared to our current horizon size. So they would be completely unobservable. Um, if we have some time, I have some backup slides that uh, can show you how you would estimate that number. And it's an extremely large scale. It's, it's, it's like 200 orders of magnitude outside the, the current horizon size. Uh, for a typical inflation model. Um, so here's our condition for eternal inflation, right? The delta phi quantum over delta phi classical is equal to the curvature power spectrum that has to be greater than unity. This is a sort of a, a quick and dirty way of doing an estimate as to whether or not you're in internal, internal inflation regime. A good, a, a, solid, a, a more quantitative way of doing it is to actually write down a Fokker Planck equation and solve for the stochastic evolution. And I'll talk about some uh, more recent work where people have actually done that in the cases that we're going to discuss. Um, so any questions, any more questions at this point? Uh, yeah, if you can go to the previous slide. Uh, yeah. So, so for, for the stochastic, so you have the basically up and down, right? right. Say, yeah. Uh, I found that very interesting in, 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 in the paper and, uh, um, but uh, is it, there's no favor, right? It's just uh, back and forth, right. basically. Uh, Gaussian random you know. fluctuations, right? So you can, yeah, you're, exactly. you're as likely to fluctuate down the hill as up. And actually, when we talk about later, talk about the example of the top hat potential, that quantum fluctuations are actually what eventually cause you to end inflation in that case. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see a case where that, that that's important coming up. OK, thank you. Uh, so, and one of the one of the key points that we're going to see is that how these quantum fluctuations operate on different kinds of potential is different, uh, and th that's one of the key points that we're going to be talking about here. So, let's give an example, right? The one that most people have seen as an example of eternal inflation is a potential that looks like this: one of these uh, one of these upward curve potentials, where you're, you're not there, there's no symmetry breaking here, right? The true vacuum is at the uh, at the zero of the field. So this is just some sort of massive scalar field with no symmetry breaking, an m squared pi squared potential, for example, the simplest thing you can think of. And this field is going to be somewhere up, uh, up on this potential. Uh, and it turns out that in inflation, this thing has to be several uh, Planck scales out, right? So that the, the field value here is uh, a couple of times m Planck. Uh, but the energy density in the field, because of the weak self-coupling, because of the, the slow roll conditions, the energy density is much, much less than the Planck density. So you don't have to worry about quantum gravity here. But um, the, the, field, the field excursion is several times the Planck scale. So that this is the basic setup of chaotic inflation. This is actually, this particular potential is pretty strongly ruled out by data right now. I'm just bringing it up as, as an example that's probably the most familiar one for, for this. And these have the nice property that when you solve slow roll equations of motion during inflation, that they are isokinetic, right? They have a constant phi dot. And this makes the calculation really easy to do. Um, so this thing is slowly rolling down the potential and the, uh, uh, the solution to the slow roll equations are, are easy to work out. And they tell you that phi dot is equal to a constant during inflation. And so the primordial power spectrum then is just the uh, 
the square of that ratio that we talked about before. So this is uh, uh, this is actually the value of the power spectrum itself is uh, h over two pi phi dot squared, h squared over two pi phi dot the whole quantity squared. So h squared over four pi phi dot squared. That has to be greater than one in order for eternal inflation to happen. So when a wave mode of order the horizon size today is leaving, this it leaves the horizon, this thing is about 10 to the minus five. But further up on, I'm pointing at my screen rather than using my mouse, further up on the potential, this ratio is going to get larger and larger earlier and earlier in inflation. And so what you find is that uh, H star here uh, is the scale at which modes of order the current horizon size leave, right? So this thing in the denominator is the Kobe normalization of about 10 to the minus five. Uh, and so that tells you that since phi dot is a constant, the further up the potential you go, the higher the potential energy in the field, the higher the Hubble parameter is. And so you, find, you, can, you can write a ratio here of in order for this, uh, this power spectrum to be one, you can write the ratio of that H of eternal inflation divided by H at the CMB scales, right? Has to be about a factor of 100. So you have to be so you, you you have to be further up the potential so that the H, the, the Hubble parameter gets bigger the further up you are, and it turns out you have to be uh, about 100 times higher Hubble parameter uh, than at CMB scales is the scale at which inf uh, eternal inflation takes place. So in fact, you can work this out in Planck units, right? So if you plug in the expressions for the power spectrum in terms of H, what you find is that the Hubble parameter at the, uh, uh, for eternal inflation, the minimum Hubble parameter you have to have for eternal inflation in Planck units is about 10 to the minus three. So what this tells you is that you are still well, well below Planckian energy densities when uh, eternal inflation sets in. So, and this is the point, of course, at which the universe becomes eternally self-reproducing, that you're as likely to climb up the hill as go down. And so inflation at that point, once you have an energy density that's about 10 to the minus 3 on Planck, or a Hubble parameter that's 10 to the minus 3 on Planck, then inflation is never going to end. There's always going to be some regions of the universe that are inflating. So this is the simplest case, and this is the one that you probably see in most of the textbooks, right? And the point here is that since phi dot here is a constant, the way you get eternal inflation is by pushing the value of your Hubble parameter up to a very high value. So not so high that you're, you, you have super Planckian energy densities, but a lot higher than it is at the time when CMB scales exit the horizon, right, by about a factor of 100. So this potential is actually kind of unrealistic, right? So if we ask the question with respect to data, um, one thing that the current CMB data allow us to answer is the question of, is this sort of convex potential that we we're, were talking about in the context of eternal inflation favored by data, or is it something like this where you actually have a field rolling off the hilltop, uh, something that would be more characteristic of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And it turns out that it's pretty easy. You can actually quite unequivocally tell the difference between these two cases. So this is a plot of tensor scalar ratio versus spectral index, sort of a standard zoo plot of inflationary parameters that I think most of this audience will be familiar with. The, the, uh, uh, the dark shaded region is the 68% allowed confidence region from Planck and bicep Keck 14. This is the Planck 2015 data that I'm plotting. Uh, and the, the outer shaded, the lighter shaded region is the 95% confidence allowed region. And now up here we see, we, I plotted a few different choices of potential this one right here is a linear potential. So everything above this diagonal line that's shaded in gray is one of these concave up potentials. Something that looks like one of these M squared phi squared models. So here's the M squared phi squared model that I was talking about here. Many, many sigma off the allowed region from Planck. It's pretty convincingly ruled out. On the other hand, here's, for example, a Starobinsky plateau potential or something like that. Everything down on the lower left-hand side of the plot that's in the unshaded region the, not, not the gray, but the white, is something that is rolling off a hilltop of some sort, either a plateau or a spontaneous symmetry breaking or natural inflation or something like that. And this dividing line here is the linear potential. So what you find is that the data quite clearly favor these sort of hilltop type models relative to these chaotic type inflation models. 
So this is a nice, simple example in order to illustrate eternal inflation, but it's not a realistic one in terms of actual data, right? The, and so the, the question here, and what, what we originally set out to do when we, when we started looking at this, was looking at these kind of hilltop models. And the expectation was, my expectation was, that once the scales in the problem got small, if the energy density was really small during inflation and the vacuum expectation value was much, much less than the Planck scale, that if I took, if you took one of these inflation models and ran it down to very small scales, that it would no longer support eternal inflation. This idea that you had to have a Hubble parameter that's really, really high in order to support eternal inflation, you could maybe get away from that. You could quench eternal inflation by having a, a, an inflation model that had very low scales. And the surprising thing that we will see is that turns out not to be true. That in fact, it, it becomes independent of the scale. So let's look at this in terms of a more realistic model. And uh, I can, if there's time, I will show you an actual calculation for a realistic hilltop model, but I wanna go through a simplified version of it that, that uh, explains the physics in a more transparent way. And so the toy model that we're gonna start with is a top hat potential. So instead of having a curved hilltop where we, the, the calculation is a little opaque, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, okay, suppose we have a constant potential V naught on some sort of uh, a top hat plateau that has a characteristic width of some mass scale mu, okay? So there are two scales, like any inflation model, there are two scales in the problem. There's the height of the potential and there's the width of the potential that's governed by the vacuum expectation value. And this is just an extraordinarily simple version of that where the scaling is quite clear. The reason this is nice is because it automatically eternally inflates because the classical field evolution is zero, right? So the slow roll solution for the field on a perfectly flat potential is that it just sits there. And so this is a model where eternal inflation happens almost automatically, right? But there's still two rates that happen, right? There is, there's, you still have the quantum fluctuations where the quantum fluctuations, and, and in fact here what you find is that the, the power spectrum formally goes to infinity, right? H squared over phi dot is infinite. This is, this is something else that we could talk about at length, but this is actually not true, of course. The power spectrum doesn't go to infinity. It's just simply an artifact of the fact that co-moving gauge is no longer well-defined for such a field. Um, and I'll just leave that one at that because that could be a whole separate talk as to how you deal with the, the gauge issues and stuff in this. So this is this trivially satisfies the condition that this fraction has to be greater than one since it's actually divergent in this case. There is no classical field evolution formally. And so instead what we have is we have a field that's entirely dominated by quantum fluctuations. And so it undergoes, we, we can approximate it right? The right way to do this is a Fokker-Planck equation, but we can approximate it as doing an, a random walk such that the sort of the, the, the distance it travels is the square root, the, the, the number of steps is the, the number of Hubble times you have to, to, to evolve. So that the square root of n, the distance that it travels in the random walk is just given by the square root of h times whatever time scale you have, okay? And so that tells you, and that time scale now is just gonna be the lifetime of inflation. Basically it says that after a certain period of, what's the characteristic time scale in which you're going to random walk off the edge of this potential in which your field excursion is gonna be of order this width mu. So we can estimate that as the, the number of steps on average that it's gonna take for you to fall off the edge of this, uh, this, this top hat and end inflation is just this width divided by the quantum fluctuation amplitude, which is the Hubble parameter. And so you can estimate, whoops, sorry, there, there, there we go. You can estimate the probability that inflation ends after some time t as just an exponential decay function. Uh, more properly for Gaussian fluctuations, this is an error function, but it's close enough to an exponential for our purposes. And that is so that that ends up being the, uh, uh, H times T times this characteristic time scale, which is just mu over delta phi quantum. So this is an expression for the probability that inflation, that you're gonna walk off the edge of this top hat after a certain amount of time T. That's an estimate. So 
the other thing that's happening during this time is that the universe is expanding exponentially quickly. And so as long as you're inflating, the volume in which you're inflating is expanding exponentially quickly. So you have a, you have a competition between two rates here. You have an exponential decay because of the random walk, but you also have an exponential growth in volume. And so our condition for eternal inflation now is we can see that we have, this is this top line here is the probability of ending inflation after time t. But in that amount of time, the volume, it, which is proportional to a cubed, goes up as e to the three h t. And so the question is, which one of these rates wins? The rate at which you're ending inflation or the way, rate at which the volume is growing? And so we can write an expression for the fraction of the space-time volume that's in a de Sitter phase as just being e to the 3 ht divided by this uh, uh, decay rate. Okay. There are subtleties here, in particular because of the fact that if you're eternally inflating, you have an infinite volume on the future uh, boundary of this thing, you run into a measure problem where it's actually very tricky to have well-defined probabilities. But this is still a good way to, of estimating rates uh, without getting into some of the larger questions about things like measure, measure problem and eternal inflation. And so basically what this says is, is if this fraction is increasing with time, you're eternally inflating. And if this fraction is decreasing with time, then uh, in, eternal inflation is quenching. So in particular, if this exponent is greater than zero, you're, you're the, the volume expansion is going to win and you have eternal inflation happening, which tells you that, that this now gives you a, uh, a bound on the scale is that this thing has to be greater than two pi mu over h, which has to be greater than about one over the square root of three. And that tells you, that gives you a lower bound on the width of this potential. The wider you make this thing, the longer eternal inflation lasts, which is just given by the square root of the potential in Planck units, okay? So as long as the width of that top hat is greater than this rate, this number, then uh, the expansion is gonna win and you're going to have eternal inflation on average. So this brings us to, the, to a comparison here. So in the first case we looked at, we had about a constant field velocity. And the way we accomplished eternal inflation was we made our Hubble parameter really big. Here, this is totally different because on the top hat, the Hubble parameter is constant. It doesn't depend on the fuel value at all, but the classical field evolution rate is going to zero. And this is so we we're accomplishing eternal inflation by having quantum dominated evolution with an approximately constant Hubble parameter. So the physics here is really different than in the case of these uh, uh, chaotic potentials. And in particular, that if I take my potential as some mass scale to the fourth, that tells me that the ratio of the width to the height of the potential is just given by the height in Planck units, right? So that there's no inherent scale here. Basically, as long as my ratio of the height to the width is uh, bigger than uh, the width in, in Planck units, I'm going to satisfy eternal inflation, which means that I can make both mu and lambda, both the height of the potential and the width of the potential, as small as I like. Even if I make these scales very, very small, this potential is still going to support eternal inflation. In fact, it gets easier and easier because as lambda gets smaller, this ratio has to only has to be bigger than a very, very small number. So counterintuitively, instead of having all of these scales, the height and the width of the potential being driven to very high values in order to, in order to support eternal inflation, in fact, it happens at any value at all, that it's completely decoupled from whether or not these, these uh, scales are close to M Planck, which is the surprising thing in this result. So this would be a good time to stop again for discussion. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask you, because I, um, it's been a while since I uh, did cosmology, but uh, is there any, any reason, oh, everybody knows what the 60 E folds, but in, in, in the previous diagram where you show the Planck, uh, where you plotted the Planck data, is it from 46, is there a, a reason why you chose a 46? I'm sorry, that I don't is, really go back. Yeah, here, right. Exactly. Uh, this is uh, taking into account uh, the uncertainty, whoops, back, please, there. This is taking into account the uncertainty in the reheat temperature. Okay. So 60 is a good rough estimate. It actually is modeled, it depends slightly on the potential logarithmically, but a, 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 a good rough estimate is that if you instantaneously reheat at about 10 to the 15 GeV, then that value is 60. Yeah. But if you reheat at a scale of about a TeV, that drops to about 46. Mm 
That's the number of E-folds corresponding to the pivot scale here. Okay. Um, so that, that's just a, that range is due to the uncertainty and reheat temperature and also uh, another contributing factor that is that we're not taking into account explicitly here is uh, uncertainty in the uh, post-inflationary expansion. You really don't necessarily know how, how that went. And so the, that this smear in the, in the model predictions is because of the uncertainties in the, uh, uh, the thermal properties of the universe after inflation. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else or should we continue? Uh, well, the, if you can uh, uh, explain again the, the um, because it's just for me, maybe not for the audience, but the, the width and the, the length again. So basically you, you can have any value. This is what right. I understand well. Right. So if you, you know, you just take this and this is true of any potential, right? If you look at, uh, there's always two scales involved here. So if we look at a standard symmetry breaking potential, it's going to have some height and it's going to have a VEV for the field, right? So that appears in these top hat potentials as just the height of the top hat versus the width of it. Um, but the same physics happens in a regular symmetry breaking potential. It's just not as evident as it is in this calculation, right? So that any potential in inflation typically is going to have two scales involved in it. The, 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 the V naught that tells you how high the potential is and mu, which tells you how wide it is. And typically in most inflation models, you're gonna find that this width has to be around the, the Planck scale. And this height is about the gut scale. It's about 10 to the 15 GE meters. So would be typical scales for these things in most inflation models. But the thing is you can come up with models where this V naught is as low as you wish as a TEV or so, right? And in that case, mu will be much, much, much will be very small in Planck units. And that's the question is we, we were thinking that if I made V, if we made V naught and mu both very small relative to the Planck scale, that this would quench eternal inflation. And in fact, the exact opposite happens, that it makes eternal inflation easier to do. And I'll comment a little bit on that in the conclusions as well. But that, that's the big takeaway here is that essentially that it is a bound on the height divided by the width, but there's no inherent scale in this. So that there's no, there, there's no way that either one of these scales is necessarily pushed up uh, close to the Planck scale the way it is in this kind of a model where the H has to be up around 10 to the minus three on Planck in order to support internal inflation, right? So that's the main takeaway here. Okay, thank you very much, Will. Shall we go on? Yeah, sure. Great. I uh, just wanted to bring up another case, which is the one that's actually favored by the data, which is a potential that looks like a plateau. So you can take one of these top hat potentials and extend it infinitely in one direction, and you end up with something that looks is a blocky equivalent of a Starobinsky model, right? And these things are trivially eternal. Once you have this infinite plateau, there's an infinite amount of space for you to, to quantum fluctuate off to, to one side. And that means that you, you're basically always going to eternal inflate on these kind of things, regardless of what the height of the potential is, right? Um, so that these things are trivially eternal. And uh, since I know that, that Tommy is involved in the, uh, this uh, 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 seminar, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, they have put out a really nice paper looking at, actually looking at stochastic evolution on these plateau potentials that just came out like a week ago. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that one. This, it's a nice treatment of inflationary dynamics on this sort of plateau potential. So let's talk about this briefly in light of the swampland conjectures. In particular, there are these conjectures now which say, in order to be consistent with a UV complete theory, these inflationary potentials have to satisfy certain conditions. And these conditions are actually highly restrictive. In particular, that the field excursion, right, which is essentially, so here's a, here's a more realistic potential. The height of the potential is V naught, the width of the potential is given by the field value, which is mu, right? So I've labeled the scales the same way except that this is now a more traditional symmetry breaking potential of the kind that you see in a textbook. This field excursion, which you can estimate to be the field VEV, this mu has to be less than or equal to M Planck. Uh, and furthermore, that the delta V over V, the change in the height or equivalently the slope of the potential has to be a order one in Planck units. And this is the thing, this second condition is the one that's very restrictive. It's, it's relatively straightforward to make inflation models where the field excursion is small in Planck units, but uh, this tells you that the field, the potential can't be too flat. It has to be steep enough 
Otherwise, it violates this de Sitter swampland conjecture. So you can plot this. So this thing has to be, uh, the slope has to be a constant C of order unity. The swampland conjecture doesn't specify exactly what C should be, whether it's 100 or 1 or 0.1 is not really, is not really well set. But you can plot this on this observational plane. So what I've done now is I've added in contours of constant slope, right? So this, this is a C of that's V prime over V in Planck units of 0 0.1, 0 0.08, 0 0.06, and so on. And what you find is that there's a very strict upper bound, is that the potential in order to be consistent with data has to have a slope in Planck units, a logarithmic slope in Planck units that's under 0.1. So it's already, the, the data are very in strong tension with the swampland conjectures already. So this is, uh, this is a big deal because if these conjectures are, are, are correct, that tells you that inflation is pretty close to, any inflation model which matches the data is in strong tension with the conjectures in the first place. That basically a single field slow roll inflation itself is just inherently in, 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 in tension with the swampland conjectures and therefore uh, would be in tension with the UV completion, right? Um, but on the other hand, how does it, but uh, one thing that was quickly realized here after these conjectures were proposed was that you run into a problem. If the slope of the potential has to be big everywhere, that's what the De Sitter swampland conjecture as originally formulated says, that runs you into problems with symmetry breaking potentials because in fact, up near the peak of these things, they have V prime over V is equal to zero. A Higgs potential violates the De Sitter swampland conjecture, right? The Higgs boson would be incompatible, according to this conjecture, would be incompatible with the UV completion. That can't be right, right? I mean, we, know, we have fields that we're pretty sure exist that would violate this conjecture that have slopes somewhere on the potential that actually are not just small, but, but vanishing because of symmetry. So later on, it was proposed that you had a, uh, so uh, Aguri, Palti, Shu, and Vafa later proposed a modified, refined swampland conjecture. There were other reasons to do this as well, but one of the, the simplest to understand is to accommodate symmetry breaking potentials, is that you either have to have a steep potential or the curvature, the second slow roll parameter, has to be big, has to be bigger than order unity or so, okay? That also is in tension with slow roll inflation models. Both of these numbers have to be much, much less than one in order for slow roll to be valid. But this modification allows you to accommodate things like a Higgs boson or a spontaneous symmetry breaking potential because now up near this peak, as long as the, essentially the mass of the field, the tachyonic mass of this thing, as long as it's big enough in Planck units, you can get away with it and you can and, and satisfy the, the refined swamp line conjecture. And so, now I've added isocontours of V double prime on this plot and show that this doesn't help you with inflation. In fact, this is even in more tension with the refined swampland conjecture because this line here is V double prime over V is 1% in Planck units. This is 2%. So that in fact that you have to have this, uh, uh, this constant here, the second constant in the refined swampland conjecture has to be a order 1% or so in order to match data in a single field inflation model, not of order unity. So this still is in strong tension with inflation models. But let's take a look at one of these hilltop models, right? Uh, so now let's look at a more realistic case and say, will this thing eternally inflate or not? And we're also going to bring in the, the, the whether consistency with swampland conjectures. One question you might wanna ask is, do these swampland conjectures rule out eternal inflation. They certainly rule out inflation that would be consistent with Planck data, right? They're, they're, the, there's just almost no way to do that in a single field model. But there's another question is, is uh, the, the supposition, and the, there, were, there were papers put out after the first conjecture was proposed, that it also entirely ruled out eternal inflation, which would be kind of a good thing, right? If you wanna say that eternal inflation it's, is inherently incompatible with any UV complete theory, that would be a very powerful result. So we want to ask the question, is that so in light of the swampland conjecture? So let's look at a more realistic hilltop type model where we have the field rolling off some sort of uh, uh, unstable equilibrium. So now the height of the potential will say is some scale lambda to the fourth and the VEV of the field is our width mu. So this is how these scales appear in a more realistic potential. 
and in fact, if we're in slow roll, we know we're going to be really, really close to this maximum so that we know that we can always run this out by basically just saying what's the dominant, what's the lowest order operator that dominates the, this non-suppressed non view of the maximum of the potential. Typically, this will look like one minus phi squared, but you can create other potentials where that's a phi to the fourth or something like that if you impose other symmetries, right? So we're going to approximate this potential as being this height times one minus phi over the width to some power p, right? And, that, and times some dimensionless coupling constant. And that's just saying, what's the leading order operator in the expansion for the, 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 the field potential uh, near the maximum of the potential, near the maximum, right? Near the symmetric point. So, and the, the answer you get depends on this exponent a little bit. And the, the ones that we're most interested in are the ones that look like uh, a Higgs potential, one minus m squared phi squared, dominating near the top, where it's a mass term. And it turns out there's some algebra involved, but basically this tells you that the width, the, the, the condition for eternal inflation is that the width of the potential in Planck units has to be greater than about two over the square root of three. And this tells you that the second slow roll parameter, this V double prime over V, has to be less than about a square root of three. That's interesting in light of the swampland conjectures because the swampland conjecture tells you that this thing has to be a, something of order one in order to satisfy, in order to be consistent with the UV complete theory. And in fact, our condition for eternal inflation, our estimate for this, is actually weaker than the swampland conjecture, right? You can eternal you will eternally inflate on one of these hilltop models as long as eta is less than about a square root of three, which is an order one number. So in fact, uh, at least uh, using this rough estimate, what you find is that eternal, internal inflation, it won't match the data, but you can internally inflate on a potential like this and still at least marginally satisfy the swampland conjectures. So the conclusion here is that the swampland doesn't necessarily kill off eternal inflation, which is kind of a big deal because that means that you still have to worry about this uh, even if you, uh, uh, in, any sort of, in any sort of string theory where you have some sort of complicated landscape, then you can be pretty sure that somewhere on that landscape is gonna satisfy this condition and you're gonna have problems with eternal inflation. Now, it's a little bit more subtle than this and I wanna point out a couple of papers that came out after the one that we wrote, uh, or the, the, the single author paper that I wrote last year which is this one by uh, uh, Sarah Shandera and, and, and her student uh, Brahma, who pointed out that this rough estimate is a little bit too naive in the sense that once eta gets to be this big, once the second slow roll parameter gets large enough, then cubic terms in, so in your cubic Lagrangian, that thing actually becomes large in comparison to your quadratic Lagrangian. And then a lot of the assumptions that are going into this rough estimate don't, don't work anymore. Essentially that you, once eta gets to be that big, your perturbative expansion that you're relying on for a lot of these uh, uh, calculations is starting to break down and you can't necessarily trust it. Basically what that tells you is you need to do a more cal careful calculation. Um, and in particular, this more careful calculation was done by Rudelius uh, in 2019, where this was actually solving a Fokker Planck equation and they came to the conclusion that pretty much just, it's, it's still on the borderline, but basically they concluded that eternal inflation is inconsistent with the swampland conjectures. But it's right on the border between the two. And so that's, that's sort of the takeaway on this. So, well, um, I, may this, I ask? Yeah, so questions before we do conclude. Oh, yeah, yeah. I actually have. Um, if you can go back uh, two, two slides ago, mm -hmm. that's enough. So you only uh, take into account uh, the even uh, uh, mo modes or, <laughs> or terms? You could do odd-numbered ones, too. Uh, but if you're I mean, assuming there, that this is spontaneous that? symmetry breaking, it's always going to be dominated by something even, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It, and I, I have some slides for other exponents, but it's not very, uh, it, it's not terribly illuminating. The, 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 the basic physical conclusion that eternal inflation is supported independent of scale is doesn't depend on what a, what uh, uh, exponent you. So I can 
Oh, it's way at the end. I, I can show you if it comes to it, but it's, it, it actually doesn't really make much of a difference what exponent you assume. Sure. And also, this, uh, this, uh, is this a hard constraint, in a way, for the second small rule parameter, for the square root of 3? What do you mean by a hard constraint? Well, well, I mean, you came to, to, to it in a, in a different way. Well, they, they, they are claiming and it's an order of 1, whereas here it has to be... Right. Uh, this is the square root of 3 is the condition for being able to support eternal inflation. So it has nothing to do with the swampland conjecture. It's just basically this is that same relation in, uh, of height divided by width that I derived for the top hat potential just expressed in a less transparent way. Now you see why I went through the top hat potential because it's the same calculation really, except it's not as apparent what, how the scales enter the problem in, in the case of a potential like this, that's all. Okay, thank you. I think we can uh, continue. Okay, we're pretty good on time, so I can just finish off. We're 44 minutes, so perfect. Uh, so three basic conclusions. The first one is that eternal inflation is really hard to avoid. Swampland conjectures, I know, if you have an inflation model that's consistent with data, that pretty much anything you write down is going to eternally inflate. And that is something of a surprising result. And in particular, it does not depend on scale. And in fact, so the other takeaway here is that there are actually two different kinds of eternal inflation, which is not something that you see mentioned very often. One is where you keep the field velocity approximately constant and you push the Hubble parameter up to high scale. The second is the Hubble parameter is approximately constant and the field velocity is dropping down nearly to zero and your quantum dominated that way. And these two different kinds of eternal inflation actually have very different properties. Uh, and in fact, it's the latter kind that is rele most relevant for models that, that match data. And so just to repeat this, this is a nice example of uh, uh, something that Eva Silverstein uh, in a paper a couple of years ago referred to as dangerous irrelevance that you can have energy scales arbitrarily small in Planck units that can have order unity effects on the global geometry of your space time. And that's a really big deal, right? And this is a nice example of that where you're eternally inflating, even if inflation is happening at LHC scales, if it's, Higgs, it's a Higgs boson or something that's doing it. Um, but that can actually affect the global geometric properties of your, of your cosmology which is uh, something of a counterintuitive result. So that's all. Thank you very much for hosting. Thank you very much. Else? Yes, I, I do have one last question, maybe. Uh, where do you go from, from, from this now? Where, where, what are your plans in, in maybe expanding this? or? If you that's a good question. That. I mean, in a... It's, it's kind of hard to say. I think it would be very interesting to look more carefully at these sort of plateau potentials, uh, like the Starobinsky ones, the one that, that, that Tommy wrote that nice paper about uh, last week, in the sense that those are so, uh, those support eternal inflation so strongly that you can really, and it's, it's also a very simple system, so you can start asking questions about the global structure of the space time and how that, uh, because one of the things that's happening here is that for example, co-moving gauge is singular, and no, co-moving gauge no longer exists. So you can't really even talk about what co-moving curvature perturbations are in these sort of circumstances until very late in inflation, for example. Um, and so there are all sorts of basic assumptions that you usually make about slow roll inflation that have entirely broken down here. And I suspect that we really don't understand these kind of sort of models as well as we think we do. Uh, and so I think it would be interesting to just further study, especially in these cases of these very simplified models that, have, that support eternal inflation on low scale. Okay, thank you very much, Will, for your time and, and the effort to, to join us in this uh, conference. And I uh, hope to see you in the discussion channel and uh, later for the live, proper live conference. Thank you. Yeah, part. I look forward to seeing the other talks. This is a great idea. Thanks for putting it together. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.